Thank you. Good morning, church. For those of you who are expecting to see our tall, handsome pastor step into the pulpit this morning to uh, open the Word of God to us, I apologize. You're stuck with me. Uh, Greg is not feeling well this week. And uh, a few days ago, he texted and, and said he wasn't feeling well, and he asked if I would cover this morning. Of course, I'm happy to do that, but uh, please be in prayer for, uh, for Greg. Uh, I think it's a sinus infection or something he's dealing with, and he graciously chose to not spread that around to all the rest of us, as much of a sharing person as he is. Uh, also, be in prayer for, uh, for Andy, uh, Brenton, our Pastor Brenton's wife and uh, Greg and Rini's daughter. Uh, is sick and is actually in the hospital right now, uh, having some issues with her heart. And uh, they've got it under control, as I understand it, and uh, we'll probably re be releasing her today. But pray for, uh, for Andy. That's why Brenton wasn't here leading us in worship this morning. Thank you for, uh, to, to uh, Christina, who, uh, <laughs> for, for leading us in, uh, in worship this morning. Uh, I, I, for some reason, years ago when I first met Jennifer, I called her Christina, and it kind of stuck. So thank you, Jennifer, and the rest of the worship team for leading us this morning, and, uh, and, and Doug for leading us in, in communion. You know, Doug is a, a guy who doesn't enjoy getting up in front of people. And uh, I, I went to church with Doug, I think, for about nine or ten years and uh, never had met him until we started coming to this church, and we uh, started serving together on the elder team. And uh, I've just been so blessed to get to know Doug and his humility and graciousness and his desire for God. He's a true gentleman, and, and uh, we're privileged to have him as one of the elders of our church. And I, I trust that you could sense that as he was leading us this morning. Let's, uh, let's, when Greg first asked me to, to speak this week, I asked him, is there something you'd like to ask, have me cover or a topic or a piece of scripture that fits with where you're going? And he said, I'd really like for you to talk about the concept of salt and light and what that means to the church. And so we're going to go to that scripture in just a minute. And I asked that the scripture be read that you just, just heard uh, from the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2, verses uh, 11 through 17. But... Uh, I, uh, my father is a, is a pastor, retired, he's 83 years old, and I was at his house this week, and, and in fact, the day that Greg had asked me to speak, and I said, hey, Dad, uh, you know, you're like the champion preacher of all time, so if you were going to speak on salt and light this week, where would, you, where would you go? And he said what my dad always has said when he's asked a question like that. He said, I would go to the Bible and talk about God, <laughs> <laughs> and that's all the direction that he gave me. But then I talked it over with my wife, and she had a lot of great ideas. Uh, to start out with, let's take a look at the, the piece of Scripture in uh, Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus actually was sharing with his disciples this concept of salt and light. This is part of what we call uh, the Sermon on the Mount and the, and the Beatitudes. Uh, Jesus had his disciples in this spot, and there was a crowd of people that had followed him. But when Jesus was saying this, he was actually, according to what the scripture says here, he was talking to his disciples. He wasn't especially talking to the huge crowd of people that were gathered. They were kind of eavesdropping as Jesus was talking to his disciples. And that's kind of important as we read this, because Jesus was saying this not to a huge group of people, some of whom were his followers, some of whom not yet were his followers, some of whom never would be his followers. He was talking to his disciples. And this is what he said. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who's in heaven. Kind of simple concepts, but what we want to talk about this morning is how do we apply this in a practical way to our life? Because what Jesus was saying to his disciples, as all these other people listened on, was basically this. You need to make sure that your life is having an impact on other people. That's the whole idea of being salt and light, right? To provide the benefits of salt, which we're not going to go into this morning, but you eat salt every day. Our bodies are designed so that we can't really live without salt. Too much salt is bad for you, but salt not only flavors, but it preserves. It does all kinds of other things as well. And we know the benefits of light and why salt and light are important. So what Jesus is saying is your lives need to have an important impact on the lives of those around you, like salt and light 
these elements that are so crucial to our lives have an impact on us. Well, I want that. Think about that for a minute. I want my life to have an effect for good, for the gospel, for the work of God on other people. I believe that you do too. If you didn't, you probably would have found someplace else to spend your Sunday morning. But how do we do that? Let's, uh, let's take a look at a story in the Bible that maybe can give us some insight. And I enjoyed doing this, to, to, to look at some of the examples of the people in the Word of God so that we can look at what happened in their lives and maybe learn a little bit about how we can let things happen in our lives in a similar way. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn to 2 Kings in chapter 5. We're going to look at it's kind of a fun, interesting old story this morning. Now, here's what, what I'm planning to do. And by the way, there, there are some, I'm, I'm sure, who are watching us online on Facebook or, or through the website and the live stream. And uh, invite you. thank you for joining us this morning, if, if that's you back there pointing at that camera. Uh, and uh, take your Bibles and turn to chapter 5 of 2 Kings also. And here's, here's a little bit of the story. So what I want to do is tell you the story. And then after kind of digesting the story and understanding what was happening, then we'll go back and make some application and think about what we can apply to our lives that we learn from the story. But here's how the story starts out. 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man and his mas- with his master and in high favor. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Interesting when you think about this, because to understand the context, you have to know that Syria and Israel were bitter enemies. And so when I first read this, my, the question popped in my mind, why would God, as it says here, the Lord had given, him, given victory to Syria? He was the highest general in the Syrian army, the most bitter enemy at this point in history of, against Israel. In fact, if you go back five years before this, just going back into the book of, uh, of 1 Kings towards the end, and some parts of the Bible are kind of tricky to get the exact chronology of when things happen and the order of events, but this is not. The books of First and Second Kings are written in order. In fact, they're measured by in the, in the 10th year of King so-and-so, this happened, and so you can kind of keep careful track of how much time had gone by. So we can know that exactly five years before this, some interesting things that happened between Israel and Syria. What had happened is uh, these, these two countries that border each other, I've been there, I've actually stood on the border of Israel and Syria in the northeast corner of Israel in the Golan Heights, and right now, if you would go there today, there are these uh, underground tunnels that you can uh, actually walk through. They're not used anymore. But when I was there, there were UN soldiers with an observation post on the, on the fence watching the Syrian armies on the other side because to this day a hotbed of trouble and it was back then too here's what had happened five years before the king of syria decided he would attack israel so he goes to israel now this was during if you know your israel history and your bible history during the time of the divided kingdom so the nation of israel was divided into israel which is in the north of the country in judah and the south of the country which had actually a separate king so we're talking about israel the king of Syria leaves Damascus, which is not very far from that northeast corner of Israel, takes his armies and he goes down to Syria, which was at that point the capital of Israel. That's where the king lived. The king, by the way, is a guy who's pretty well known. His name was Ahab. His wife was Jezebel. You remember them, right? M- mamas don't name their little girls Jezebel. That just doesn't happen. These are not good people. But Ahab, this wicked, wicked king, and his wicked wife Jezebel, were the, he was the king of Israel, and the king of Syria comes down with his armies and surrounds the outer wall of the city with this humongous, well-trained, well-equipped army, and the army of Israel, the people of Israel inside the city of Samaria, really had no hope. The king of, of Syria sends this message in to the king of Israel. He sends a message and he says, Here's what I'm going to have you do. See, I got you surrounded. Send out all of your gold and silver and your best women and children, is what he said. He, he wanted just, to, you pick the best ones, the best women and children, give them to me. And this is what the king of Israel said. He said, okay. And that was his plan to do that. Well, then the king of Syria realized he had things coming his way. And so he sends another message back in and he says, you know what, what we're going to do instead, instead of trusting you to pick the best women and children and make sure you send out all the silver and gold, 
we're going to just come on in and we'll just take our pick and make sure we get everything that we want. Well, at that point, the, uh, the prophet of God said to the king of Israel, God's not going to let this happen. And so he sent a note back out to the king of Syria telling him, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to comply. I already told you we'd do the one thing. Now you're asking for more and we're going to just say no. And so the king of Syria, in all of his confidence, sends a message back in, kind of mocking the king of Israel. All of this happens. Anyhow, at the bottom line, uh, what God did is, as he had done so many times before, he miraculously de delivered the Syrian army, who had is Israel's totally surrounded, delivered them into the hands of the, of the king of Israel, and the Syrian army was demolished. Okay, so uh, the next year, something else happens. The king of Syria is like, well, you know, that, that was a, a stroke of bad luck. And, uh, and I think probably what happened is, is the gods of Israel, they're real good about fighting up in the hills, but we're going to attack them in the valleys. Uh, smart battle plan, right? And so the king of Syria decides that he's going to attack the people of Israel now in the, in the valley or in the lowlands. And so they go, well, God didn't like this message much. Uh, God sent word from, through his prophet Elijah to the king of Israel and said, they're mocking me now. They think that I'm a God of just the hills and I can't handle things in the valley. So when they come in, I'm going to deliver them into your hands. And what happened, to make a long story short, is 100,000 Syrians were killed on the battlefield. A bunch of the rest of them took, took flight and ran towards a city where they could take shelter. And when they got in the city inside the walls to take shelter, God caused the walls of the city to collapse on them. 27,000 more Syrians were killed inside that city. So I'm just telling you all this to give you a picture of the background of this story between Israel and Syria, Syria, the country that this guy Naaman is the head general of. So you, you get that, the tension between these two? And this is why it's curious when you read in the first verse of chapter 5 that this was a great man in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. God had given victory to Israel again and again and again and this was the enemy of Israel, why would God have given this guy favor? Well, one more thing happened. Uh, remember, this is uh, King Ahab and Jezebel that we're talking about. And Ahab and Jezebel had rebelled against God maybe one too many times. And without going into the details of this part of the backstory, through the prophet Elijah, uh, God proclaimed that Ahab would be killed in battle. Now, this wasn't something to make the Syrians great. This was God's judgment being poured out on this wicked king Ahab and on his wife Jezebel. And so they go to battle, and, uh, and there's a lot more in there. If you want to go back into the last few chapters of the book of 1 Kings and read that, it is really interesting reading, and I encourage you to take a few minutes and do that. But here's kind of what happened. The, the Israelites, along with the, the Judeans this time, they attacked Syria. They, they were full of confidence, and they go out into the battle, led by King Ahab, and during that battle, the Bible tells us that one of the archers of the Syrian army uh, pulled back his arrow and let it fly. In the old King James, it says, at a venture, like just taking a chance. I'm just going to shoot a shot in the air and see what happens. Well, here's what happened. That shot came down and penetrated the seam of the armor of King Ahab, and, uh, and it didn't kill him instantly. He, uh, he was there all day in his chariot in the battle bleeding but the armies lost and at the end of the day he died okay so now let's go back to chapter 5 and verse 1 and pick up our story because this is some of the important backstory to understand the, the that Syria was an enemy of Israel and this guy Naaman was the general of the army of Syria the armies of Syria, Syria had been defeated again and again and again miraculously by the people of Israel because of their one true God but Naaman, most likely, was the general in charge of the army that one day when one of his soldiers at a venture pulled back his arrow and was able to successfully finally kill the king of Israel. And so Naaman is now a hero in Syria. Got that? Does that all make sense? That's a long introduction to the story. But I think it matters because it helps us to understand the context of all that we're going to read about here. Let's go back to the end of verse 1. It says, He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Leprosy, as I'm sure you know, at that time was pretty much a death sentence. If you had leprosy, not only were you going to die, but you were going to die kind of a slow and painful death. It's very contagious, and you were required to go and live in a leper colony away from anyone else. 
and so you would die alone or with people. It sounds a lot like some of the things we're dealing with today, doesn't it? Uh, except actually much, much worse because there was no treatment and there was really no chance of survival. If you had leprosy, then you were going to die this miserable death. And this great and powerful man was a leper. In verse 2, we pick it up. It says, Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, remember, these guys were enemies of Israel, and what, even when they weren't formally at war, they had raiding parties going back and forth across the border constantly, uh, raping and pillaging and taking slaves from the people in the villages that were unprotected. On one of their raids, they had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. So get that picture. This little girl was taken in a raid of one of the villages along the border, taken back to Damascus, and not just made a slave, but made a servant of the wife of the general, the second most powerful man in the powerful nation of Syria, and she was a slave. Not a woman, not a young woman, the Bible says, a little girl. So this little girl is a servant to the wife, and she's aware of what's going on in the house, and she gets the idea that Naaman, this powerful man, has leprosy, and he's going to die, and nobody can do anything about it. And so she says to her mistress, the lady she worked for, Naaman's wife, you know, Naaman ought to go to Samaria and find the prophet of God so he can be healed. I think that's very interesting, and here's why. Because this little girl was uh, obviously respected enough by Naaman and his wife that they actually listened to her advice. Can you imagine a general, the top general of the most powerful army in that part of the world, maybe in the entire world in that day, taking advice from a little girl who was a slave who was captured on a raid from a little village along the border? And he's got this big, he's used to taking advice, I'm sure, or having people who gather around him and they have counsel about how they're going to attack the enemy and what they're going to do in war. And the king would listen to them and he knew how to take advice and how to give advice, but probably was not accustomed to taking advice from a little Hebrew girl who was a slave in his house. But he did. Why do you suppose that is? Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot of details here, but we, we can kind of assume a few things. One is that Naaman was aware of the miraculous defeats that his army had suffered again and again under the king of Israel. And they thought this, king, this God of Israel, that the Israelites worshipped, was good in the hills but not in the valleys. And then they come to find out he's pretty good in the valleys too. And so there's this mystery surrounding the Hebrew people and this God that they serve and I'm sure he had a lot of interest about who is this little girl who's now in my house and she's coming and telling me that I can be healed if I will go and find this prophet. Whatever it was, it got his interest. And so he decided that this is a good thing to do. But you know, it was complicated and here's why. Because he was the top general and the worst enemy of Israel. And he couldn't just decide one day, you know, I'm going to just go on a hike and waltz all over to Israel and walk into the capital city inside the wall gates and, and find this prophet. All kinds of bad things could happen if he did that. Could you imagine the joy that the Israeli army would have in finding that the top general from the army of Syria had just come right into Samaria and come into their, uh, their headquarters and they could capture him and kill him and put him on display and do all those things that enemy, enemy armies do to the top generals of their enemies. There's another complication too. If he just snuck off there somehow and his own king found out, his own king would have to start wondering, is my top general a spy? What's he doing going over to Israel? I mean, it just wasn't something he could do. So what he did, he went to his king, Ben-Hadad, and he told his king about this slave girl in his home who said if he goes into Samaria that he could find this prophet and be healed. Well, the king liked that idea. And so the king decided he would write a letter to the enemy king, the king of Israel, and, uh, and see if he could arrange for his servant to go. And so the Bible tells us, and we'll just pick it up in the text here, um, verse 5, And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of leprosy. Well, the king of Israel received this procession, 
of all the chariots with these piles of gold and silver. And it says 10 changes of clothes. That's just not the suitcase for the trip. Those are luxury items. They're like Louis Vuitton purses or something. They're taking as gifts, you know, fancy things for the king. And the king of Israel sees this guy come in. He receives him. He opens the letter and he reads it. And his re reaction was, this is not good. This is a setup. I mean, who am I that I could heal a leper or, or, or save a life like this? The king of Syria knows that I can't do this, and he sent his general and all these riches to me to trick me so that he would have a reason to attack us. Now, here's a moment where we should go back and talk about the king of Israel a little bit, this guy who was the king. Because remember, Ahab, the wicked king, and Jezebel, his wicked wife, had been killed. When Ahab was killed, his son Ahaziah became king. Ahaziah was not a good guy either. And like Ahab, his father, Ahaziah, the son who became king, had all of this terrible tension between him and the prophet. Now, back in this day, the king was the king. You understand what a king is, but the prophet was the prophet. The prophet was really the guy. The king could make any decision he wanted in leading the country, but then the prophet would come along, and if the king was on the wrong track and doing something that was against God's law, the prophet would come to the king and say, hey, king, you, you can't do this. Thus saith the Lord. And if the king would disobey God, there would always be consequences to pay. He's, this king now saw that happen to his father Ahab and his mother-in-law Jezebel. And then his brother Ahaziah, when he became king, he had a conflict with the prophet. He thought he would flex his muscles a little bit and show the prophet who was boss. That didn't go too well. His life didn't even last a full year after becoming king because God had proclaimed that he would die of his sickness, and he did. And now this brother, so there was Ahab, his son became king. He died within a year. Now his little brother is the king. And I think what we can assume is this little brother had probably learned a couple of lessons about how things should work between the king and the prophet. He saw things go badly for his dad and for his big brother. And so now he's in this position. That just gives us a little bit of background on the thinking of this king. And so this king, uh, when he gets this letter from the king of Syria, he tears his clothes because he realizes that this is probably some kind of a trick and a trap and, uh, and, and their armies had been, the armies of Israel had been weakened over the years, and the army of Syria was ready to attack them, and, uh, and things wouldn't go well. The prophet, Elisha, hears that the king is mourning, and he'd torn his clothes. So he sends word to the king and asks what's going on. The king tells him, and here's what the prophet Elisha says. We can pick this back up again in the text in verse 8 of chapter 5. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, now that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So the prophet Elisha says, Don't worry about it, king. Just send him to me. I think God is going to do something special here to prove once again that there is a God in Israel and there's a prophet who speaks for him. And so Naaman and his entire entourage with his chariots of silver and gold and fancy clothes goes to the prophet's house expecting great things. And the prophet Elisha, instead of coming out to greet him, just sends one of his servants out. And the servant says, basically, thanks for coming by. Here's what the prophet, he's kind of busy today. You know, he's taking a nap or something and uh, eating his lunch. And he told me to just tell you this. He doesn't really need to see you. So just go down to the river, the Jordan River, and, uh, and, and dip in there seven times. Wash yourself good seven times. Back out, go down, wash yourself. Do that seven times. And after the seventh time when you come up, everything's going to be good. Your skin's going to be uh, healed, and you can just go on home. No need to actually bother the prophet. Well, I didn't sit too well with Naaman. Because Naaman had come a long way. And Naaman was a powerful man. He was the second most powerful man in the enemy country who could actually dominate the armies of Israel, theoretically. And he didn't like this too well. And his response is this. We see in verse 11 of chapter 5, But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand up and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand all over the place and cure the leper. I thought that would be some kind of an honorable, fancy procession, waving of arms and shouting of fancy words. 
and I would be healed that way. And it would be kind of fun for everybody to watch, and I have stories to tell when I go home, talk to my wife, and tell the little slave girl about what happened when I went to see this prophet, how great that was, but instead I didn't even get to see the prophet. He tells me to go wash in this filthy river. I have better rivers than that right back in Damascus. I'm not going to do it. And then his servants start talking to him like, hold on now, boss, you know, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea. We came all this way to just do what the guy said and see what happens. And so he does. You know the story. He goes down, washes one time, two times, four times, five times, six times. Nothing happens. The seventh time he washes, comes back out. And the Bible says that his skin went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. So that's what happened with the story of Naaman. Jesus sat on the hillside that day with his disciples and thousands of other people listening in. And he said to them, go and be the salt of the earth. And don't lose your saltiness because when salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing except to just be thrown out into the street and trampled like it's dirt. And you're the light of the world. But the thing about light is it has to be seen. In a house, you set it up on a stand so it can shine all around. The last thing you'd ever want to do is put a basket over it so it would be of no use and no one could actually see anything because you had the light covered. That would make no sense at all. You should be like a city set on the hill and your light shining everywhere. And the disciples were sitting there in the grass. I've been to this spot. I sat in that grass. And they listened to him that day. And they had to wonder a little bit like you and I would wonder if we're thinking about this right now. How do you do that? Like, what's involved in being salt? What's involved in being light? How do you actually carry that out? Because I want to do that. God help me to be that kind of a person. And that's why I wanted to look at the story of Naaman today. Because it's a fairly simple story. It's a story that probably most of you have heard many, many times told it to your kids or grandkids. If you haven't, you should. But here's some things that we can learn from this as we wrap up our teaching today. A few applications that we can make. Looking back and observing some of what happened in 2 Kings chapter 5. First of all, I'd like to, to say to you that being salt and light as Christ commanded, it's not an outreach program it's not something that we would schedule to do here at the church and on the third saturday of september we're all going to be salt and light that day or we're going to start the woman's salt and light ministry and you'll come on thursday nights and do and be salt and light to one another i mean it could be all of those things but it's not a program that we plan and execute as part of our church it's just a way of life it's an identity it's the church as a whole it's the people of the church just living out the word of God, living for Christ in the best way that we know how day to day. And that's what we saw happening with several of the characters in the story that we looked at this morning from 2 Kings chapter 5. The second point that I want to make sure we take home today is this. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't all have the same abilities. We don't have the same personality. We don't have the same station in life. We're all kinds of different people who do different things, who have different backgrounds, different education, different personalities, all of that. You know what? The same thing was true of the 12 disciples. There was all kinds of variety of personality and background and education and gifting among those guys. And yet, like them, the expectation on us is that we're called to be salt and light. In our story, we looked at prophets. There were a couple of prophets, Elisha and Elijah, who were in this story. Both of them had this strong interaction with kings where they would stand up and make a declaration, a proclamation, thus saith the Lord, and even to the point where they would point to the king and say, God said that you are going to die because, what, uh, because of what you just did, or because of the way you've lived, the choices that you've made. And there are people around us sometimes who feel like they have that 
uh, prophetic gifting. I'm not sure that that in the way that we see it in the Old Testament is really that way today. And I think if you are one of those people who has that tendency to, to preach proclamations of doom to people, you should be a little bit careful and make sure that you're doing it properly and in the Spirit of God. By the way, I saw this last week Pastor Greg did something similar to that that was done with so, such humility, a, a post on Facebook that, where he talked about a decision made by the Supreme Court that had to do with the unborn. And he called it a proclamation of woe. And it was, I think, very accurate, very well written and well delivered with compassion and with truth. But we have to be careful of that prophetic uh, tendency. But we had prophets in the story that were the prophets of God who really were empowered by God to speak his word. And when they told the king, you are going to die, or when they told Ahaziah, Ahab's son, you're not going to get out of bed from the sickness that you have right now, you will die instead. And that happened exactly like the prophet said again and again and again. So there were the prophets. There were also the kings, people who had this tremendous authority and responsibility. And those two go together, don't they? Some of you have employees, have run businesses, have been in charge of people had to make decisions in your business that affected not only the employee that worked for you, but their family as well. And if you fired somebody or gave them a raise or whatever you did, the decision you made with your employee, that would have an effect on their family and sometimes even other people. And that kind of authority brings with it great responsibility. And the kings of Israel, even the king of Syria, who was a wicked king, had that authority and that responsibility. And they were required to live out their life in a certain way in light of that. There was the general. We didn't go clear to the end of the story of Naaman, but after Naaman was healed, he pro professed faith in the God of Israel. And we don't know much about him after that, but you can be sure that his life continued to have an impact for God as he went back to Syria, serving his king and leading the armies of his country. And then there's that slave girl who we don't know much about. There is that one part of a sentence in the entire word of God that's written about her. But there is something about that girl, that little girl, that caused the people that she served to pay attention to what she said. And they saw enough in her that when she said something about the God of Israel and the prophet, they listened and acted accordingly. Here's the bottom line. The ones with the small voice and the low influence often are the most impactful. So don't worry about your position or your personality or your gifting or your education or whatever when it comes to your ability to be salt and light among the people around you. Do you think that little girl got up that morning with a big plan or she went into this household with a plan of how she was going to see, do everything she could to lead Naaman the general to, into faith into the one true God? I doubt if that was really her objective. She probably was just trying to stay alive and be a servant in this house. But as she did it, the light of God and the salt of his word was shared with the people around her and she had that impact. Here's the third thing. We see in this that privilege is not an advantage in being salt and light. We had these kings, general, the prophets who had great privilege but the one in this story who we really look to as having had that impact of salt and light was actually the little slave girl. Privilege is not an advantage and difficulty is not an excuse. Can you imagine being a little girl who's taken by a raiding party from your village, probably in the middle of the night, off to the enemy territory and made a slave in the city of Damascus, the capital of the enemy? We saw the people of privilege, Ahab, Jezebel, Ahaziah, Maybe the worst characters in the story and the one who actually had an impact was the humble slave girl who had nothing but difficulty in her life. And here's, here's the fourth and final thing I want to leave with you this morning. God will display himself through his people. God displayed himself through the prophets. God displayed himself through the kings. God displayed himself through the slave girl. And God ended up displaying himself also through Naaman. God will display himself and his work through his people. Sometimes even those who are unfaithful. Sometimes even those who are wicked. Have you ever heard people say this? Maybe you've said it yourself. You know, God can't use somebody who's thus and so. Somebody who's not really right. The truth is God can and does 
use all kinds of people. I had this old pastor, this was years ago when I was a young guy, talking to this, at that point, a very old man who's since gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, years ago, and I remember this statement as we were sitting in his living room talking one day. He said, Marshall, God doesn't really care. Not, not God doesn't care. It doesn't make any difference to God whether you're an Ahab or you're more like the slave girl. It doesn't make any difference to God. He's going to do his work either way. But it makes a huge difference to you. Which one are you going to be? You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Salt that loses its saltiness is, is of no use. Light that is covered and hidden is of no value. The Savior sat on that hillside that day telling his disciples and through scripture telling you and me that his desire for us is to be salty and to be lit. And we should go and do that. I want to live that kind of life. I want to have that impact on others. Do you? And so how we do that is by coming to him and looking to him day after day, doing the best that we can to follow the teaching of Scripture, by listening to that still small voice inside of us that's guiding us and saying, this is the way, walk in it. The things that we know, the things that we understand from Scripture, Focusing on those things, drawing near to God, reading his word, spending time in prayer with him, and letting that salt and that light happen through us the way it happened through the slave girl, or the way it happened through the prophet. Even the way it happened through Naaman, and even the way it happened through the wicked kings, when they were actually working against God, but God was doing his work in them anyhow. Be that person. Be that follower. Be that salty person who's spreading light the light of the gospel, the light of the word of God. It's God's desire to do this through you. You know, sometimes we go to God and we cry out to him, asking him to do things that we don't really know for sure that it's what he wants to do or not. Asking God to do something in our lives and our family that we know as we pray, God might do this, but he might not do this, and we'll have to wait and see what God's will actually is. This isn't one of those prayers. Jesus sat on the hillside and said, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, go and be this way. And if we come back to him and pray, God, I want to be this way, help me to be the salt of the earth today and the light of the world today as I live out my life for you, what do you think his answer to that prayer is going to be? I think we can be confident that when we pray that prayer with a pure heart and a desire to see God work in us, we can be confident that he will do so. In closing, I want to go back to that scripture that was read for us this morning from 1 Peter chapter 2. We, went, we read from verse 11 through 17. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct, sorry, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Father, our prayer this morning is that you would do this work in us, that you would help us to live such good lives among the Gentiles, among the pagans, among the people who don't care about you or desire to follow you or have any interest in what you would say to them, that they would see your people living such lives among them that when they would make accusations against us or against you, that they would see our good deeds and glorify you. Father, I pray that you would do this work in us. Make us salt. Make us light. Let your word spread through us to the people around us, the attitudes that would be godly and right before you. Father, may people see those attitudes in us, the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts, the conduct that we display. And Father, more than that, may we speak boldly of the grace and the love and the goodness of
of God as it's demonstrated through the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood shed on the cross, the forgiveness of sins, new life and relationship that we can have with Almighty God because of your grace. Father, do this work in this church and your people. In us we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. God bless you today.